Guests, ladies and gentlemen, good evening. Welcome to Talal Abu Ghazali Knowledge Forum, the brainchild of His Excellency Dr. Talal Abu Ghazali, who saw an opportunity for a platform that could open dialogue, conduct research, and studies of all aspects of economy and business at local, regional, and international levels, and at the same time, share the results with decision makers. Before we introduce our guest for this evening, I would like to announce that Talal Abu Ghazali Business and Culture FM Radio is broadcasting live this existing session across Jordan. How empowered and educated children can break the cycle of poverty in Jordan is a very interesting subject that will be tackled by our guest who has a solid 20 years of experience in international development programming in Africa, Asia, and the Middle East. He joined UNICEF in 1995, accumulating a vast knowledge from around the world. And now, without any further delay, ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Robert Jenkins. Thank you. I want to welcome you first, but uh, I want to say, uh, inform you that we are on the air on Talal Abu Ghazali uh, uh, Radio for Business and Culture, uh, 102.7, this, uh, this FM station, radio station, is, uh, is now broadcasting our, uh, our event. Number two, uh, everything we say is recorded so that out of transparency we have to tell you that every statement you make uh, is, uh, is recorded uh, and that's our duty to tell you that. And uh, when we start, uh, our distinguished guest, uh, guest speaker is willing to take questions later on uh, so please, when you ask, state your name and organization for the purpose of uh, record taking. Uh, I am very, very honored to, to host today uh, Robert Jenkins. Uh, His Excellency represents a noble organization. I had the privilege of uh, seeing on hands-on the valuable services uh, this organization is doing in this country, particularly at, uh, at the uh, uh, Zatari, Zatari camp. Uh, everybody knows what uh, UNICEF is doing. Uh, we probably know it in general, but we would uh, be able to know more uh, information today and uh, as after this session also, we will be preparing a press release uh, for public knowledge. And I will be also sending a report to the Royal Court, because this is the practice of this forum, to inform the Royal Court of uh, what we do uh, in this forum, uh, because we are mission-oriented. This is not a place for debate and thinking or uh, uh, um, idealistic discussions, everything we do here uh, aims at uh, developing uh, human capacities in this country. So uh, uh, I warmly welcome our distinguished guest and uh, the floor is yours. Sir. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Tomal Abu Ghazali, and um, thank you for providing this opportunity. Um, uh, I must have, I've lived in Jordan for more than four years and I'm running out of excuses for not being able to speak in Arabic, um, so my apologies. But after you have just said that everything is recorded even more so, I think I'm safer in my mother tongue English. Um, but forgive me, maybe the next time, if I am ever uh, invited back, I will try and uh, speak in uh, Arabic. Um, but thank you very much and uh, I very much appreciate this opportunity. Um, we have, uh, I think the proposal is for me to speak about 20 minutes and then we'll have more time for interaction. 
Um, if I'm speaking too quickly, please uh, tell me, especially for translation, I will slow down. Um, the position that uh, I'm taking in this, uh, in this lecture, in this contribution, is to link education with um, economic development, basically education with breaking the cycle of poverty, and the power of education to enable children to break that cycle. What we mean by cycle, uh, just to clarify that term in the title, is if your parents are poor, your chances of being poor as you grow up are obviously increased, like all over the world. But how to break that cycle, so that even if I grew up in poverty, I may, um, as an adult, live free from poverty. How do we break that cycle between parents and children? UNICEF and myself believe very strongly the key ingredient to break that cycle is education. And that's what I'm going to be talking about. Specifically, I'm going to zero in, I'm going to be trying to be quite practical. I'm going to zero in on um, four basic uh, points. One is the importance of early childhood development. Um, that's one uh, and I'll use some global evidence on proving how important that is to break the cycle of poverty. The second is to look overall at the quality of education and improving the quality. The third is to talk about education in youth and providing youth uh, with engagement opportunities. And the last is, um, is a little bit of an aside, but I think it's very important to this discussion, which is the importance of social protection or a social safety net. And the logic there being, it, uh, even if you have a high quality education system, there will always be a certain percentage of children in any society that require specific assistance to enable them to appreciate and realize the potential of the education system. So those are the four basic points. Beginning, and I think if it all goes as planned, something's going to magically appear. Oh, there we go, right? It's all over the screens. It's everywhere. Okay, Both ways, right. also on the back. I guess we are in a world-class uh, IT-enabled organization, so it... Um, <laughs> Don't worry. Yeah, right. um, so um, what you see on... The, there, there won't be many slides. I think there's five or six, but this first slide is what's called a population pyramid. I think many people will be familiar with this. Um, all countries in the world basically have pyramids that uh, look a little like this, meaning as you age, um, you know, the, the, the pyramid gets smaller. Um, the uniqueness of Jordan, or the interesting part to this, is how young the population is. And I see many people nodding. I just want to make sure we're all on the same page. 40% of uh, people living in Jordan are under the age of 18. And an amazing 63% are under the age of 30. That is a, is a very unusually high percentage of people that are young. And of course, one of the takeaways linked to this um, lecture is what an amazing potential, an engine for growth that provides um, the kingdom. Many, I come from Canada, but many countries in Europe, you will see a much uh, flatter or uh, more of a box shape before the top of the pyramid. And they're desperately looking for more young people as an engine for growth. So this is, uh, this is just something to keep in mind. Obviously, if we address the four points I've mentioned, Jordan has, a, has that much more potential to realize um, positive change. Um, the, just to zero in a little bit on youth specifically, I think, as many people know, um, Jordan does have quite significantly high unemployment rates. And that will link uh, for youth in particular, particularly along, among young women. Um, there's a very low female participation rate in the labor market in Jordan. Um, and that obviously links to the discussion then around education and breaking the cycle of poverty. So when you have a young population and you have a population that um, has relatively high unemployment rates, um, amongst the young in particular, again, you have incredible potential to, um, as an engine for growth. Um, Obviously, Jordan also is difficult to sum up, and I won't. I'm going to move straight to the, uh, the statistics I'm not going to go into. 
Um, but there are uh, very real regional uh, dynamics. I'm just talking about the quantitative information, and many of you, or all of you, will know more than I do about, um, about the different areas in Jordan and the different regions. But I think it's important to know that um, this conversation can only move so far when we talk about the country as a whole, because there are very specific um, attributes or characteristics of different regions and different parts of the country, whether it be in Amman or West Amman or, or in the south or in the north. And um, it links to availability of water. It links to the different uh, uh, access to markets, etc. But um, I will be just talking about the country as a whole. And again, recognizing limited time, we'll zero in on, um, on how education links. The next slide, I'm moving now to early childhood development. Now, I saw this slide about a year ago, but I still think, it, I think it's very powerful, so I'm sharing it um, here. And it's, what you see here is a picture of a brain of a, of a, um, of a young person. And you, on the left, you see someone who um, has been engaged in early childhood development and has been linked to this as um, uh, highly stimulated. And the brain on the right is someone who has, uh, has not been. And um, I'll just move to the next slide for a second. Um, I'll, what the message is, is um, the power of early childhood development can put, it's in a sense, it, it wires the child's brain in order for them to enable their full potential, intellectually and otherwise. And what you see here is, um, if you, it's showing you get put on a different path, a different trajectory, if you're um, highly stimulated intellectually as a young child. And therefore the importance of um, education and organized education. Obviously, it does not mean um, necessarily academic education. We're talking about three-year-olds, four-year-olds, five-year-olds, but critical is intellectual stimulation. A lot of verbal cues, a lot of questioning, a lot of playing uh, with objects, etc. Um, and organized learning opportunities, meaning with groups of other children facilitated by a skilled uh, educator, um, has shown to be one of the greatest investments, return on investments in the public sector. Because of this idea of it puts a child on a different trajectory for life. So linking education to breaking a cycle of poverty, one key uh, dimension to that is organized educational learning at young ages. Currently in Jordan, as you may know, um, there is uh, quite a difference in accessibility of young children to organized learning. Um, outside of, um, of Amman, it is largely, um, there is very low accessibility, meaning um, four-year-olds, there are very few, a low percentage of four-year-olds attend organized educational learning in many parts of the country. So this would be one very real investment that could be made by UNICEF and by the government and by all of us collectively to have a very real impact on uh, breaking the cycle of poverty, early childhood development. That's my first, uh, and so maybe just to give a quantitative figure, um, there have been various global studies that have um, assessed the return on investment. Some of those studies have concluded $6 for every $1 invested. Others have uh, estimated $17, meaning for every $1 invested by public resources or community resources in expanding education opportunities or stimulation for young children, you will, over a lifetime, receive $17 return in terms of an engine for uh, growth for your economy. Okay, um, that's what that slide says. Basically from $6 to $17, right? Let me move to the second argument, just so I don't run out of time, which is... Um, no, please take your time. Okay. Don't, you don't have to, to comply with the 20 minutes because what you're saying is very valuable information. Thank you. 
Um, thank you for that. You can always stop me whenever I get no, uh, okay. less valuable. I will not stop you. I, okay. okay. Thank you. Please take um, your time. So the second uh, argument is around quality. Because obviously education in itself is only useful when it is um, of high quality. Um, so access alone, and UNICEF is, a, is a, one of the problems globally, we are very interested in an indicator such as the percentage of children attending school. And obviously that is a very important global indicator. Are you 90%, 95%? In the case of Jordan, it is a very high percentage of children are attending primary school. But in terms of breaking the cycle of poverty, it is absolutely critical what happens in the classroom. And overall, and I think uh, this may be something for discussion, and it's the case in many countries, it's also the case in Jordan, there remains an overemphasis on um, knowledge transfer. And if you want to call it rote learning, memorization, etc. And those of you who have children who are uh, studying for the Tajihi, you will know how much memorizing that, um, that entails and also how much stress. Um, those of you who are involved in business can, uh, can hopefully contribute to this discussion at some point, but I, um, I would uh, put on the table that the skills now for to be engines for growth in a modern economy are no longer how much people know and how much people have memorized, but rather whether people can solve problems and can present new ideas. And so when I say quality of education, um, what I mean by is to break the cycle of poverty, I mean education which enables children with, to have the skills to participate and contribute in a modern competitive economic environment such as here. And so um, what you see here on the slide is, um, so there's, there's uh, maybe this is a little bit um, hard to, uh, to see. The, the bottom line is there is very little um, correlation between um, years of schooling and, um, and economic growth. But if you see the next, there is a very real correlation between test scores, especially testing on these skills I've mentioned, problem solving and, um, and uh, questioning, etc., on economic growth. And so you have some very famous education systems like uh, Finland or Singapore or are two of the most famous. Their entire education systems are geared towards uh, children graduating to be able to ask excellent questions. Not to answer questions, to ask questions. So it's a very different uh, perspective. When you look at that graph, you will see that those countries with those type of education systems are very highly correlated with faster economic growth. If um, it's obviously particularly uh, relevant, this discussion, with vulnerable children, because less vulnerable children may be um, being questioned and being stimulated and being challenged, etc., outside of the education system, at home, with families, with friends, etc. Um, so they may spend their time in a formal education system still um, focusing on knowledge um, acquisition outside the education system are in a stimulating environment. Vulnerable children, for a whole bunch of reasons, um, are even further, um, will further benefit from an education uh, system uh, that shifts towards these areas. And obviously why that's important, not only for those individual vulnerable children, but as an engine for growth, obviously the key is to enable all children to realize their full potential. Then you will be running at full speed if everyone is fully realizing their potential. So that's um, the, uh, the, um, the point I wanted to make on quality and how we define quality of education. Let me move now to youth engagement. Um, so at the beginning I mentioned the young population in Jordan that we all recognize it's a huge potential. 
I think we've all also recognized the uh, current unemployment rates amongst youth, and particularly amongst uh, amongst female uh, young people. So um, the initiatives that um, uh, now this is going to seem sound a bit strange, but um, where UNICEF is moving in this regard is that youth require um, more engagement opportunities as a preliminary focus in order to enable them to contribute most effectively to the economy, in order to realize a job. So um, instead of a, a focus on the unemployment rate of youth, which is a very real um, challenge that needs to be addressed over time, we feel very strongly, we think the key emphasis now should be around enabling youth to be able to more effectively participate, including, for example, through volunteer opportunities or other engagement opportunities to gain life skills and other skills, employability skills, to transition to the labor market. So not as uh, the more traditional way of thinking of a life cycle, maybe I go to school, I go to tertiary education, I graduate and I work. But there are many uh, innovative uh, initiatives throughout the world that put in, into that cycle um, other opportunities for youth to gain experience which will enable them to have the, to gain those, strengthen those employability skills to eventually enter to the labor market. And, and I'd be very interested to also hear from any uh, people who are involved in companies here. The companies that we engage with as UNICEF, um, including CEOs of the largest companies, and it'd be interesting to hear your uh, opinions, um, doctor, are um, the key skill set on the first day of the job are actually more related to life skills and employability, being able to communicate, being able to work with others, being able to ask questions like I mentioned, being able to solve problems um, interactively, and less about what you know, um, that you learned potentially, mostly theoretically in your school environment. So how do we hone those skills that are most useful for employers that is, from, uh, that is through providing pathways of engagement and interaction for youth. So for example, um, providing 17, 18 year olds the opportunity to volunteer in their local schools, for example, after school, running after school programs. It can be um, through things like clubs and uh, other uh, uh, interactions with their peers or facilitated by others. It can be through um, uh, other skill sets like uh, music and arts and uh, theater and other um, ways of participating and expressing yourself. If we look at our, uh, back to our education system here and in relation to youth, um, I think there is still room for us to work together on expanding these other more dynamic ways of uh, youth learning and engaging to enable them to bridge to the employment market more effectively. Of course the classic example is um, if you ask uh, engineering companies, um, their impression, no that's okay, their impression of the skill set of a engineer that has graduated immediately from a university in Jordan. Um, how, um, what skill set needs to be required, uh, further strengthened, and what we have been hearing in UNICEF, and we have some studies on this, is overwhelmingly the importance of um, these skills that can instead be strengthened through engagement opportunities. The last is on um, social protection, my fourth uh, point. So as I mentioned at the beginning, even with a full universal early childhood education program, which I mentioned as one of the key uh, ways of breaking the cycle of poverty, the second is improving the, or enhancing the quality of education. The third is more engagement opportunities for youth to strengthen uh, life skills. 
there will still be a segment of, the, of any population in any country that will require direct assistance. Um, it's a, like a social protection floor, which will enable those children to participate in any of these opportunities. And so um, that can be through uh, a cash assistance program for those extremely vulnerable uh, uh, families, like you see in the National Aid Fund, for example, run by the Ministry of Social Development. It can be through um, local community groups that are, that are identifying and supporting vulnerable households. But if you start with a premise, um, well, you can come at this from two different ways. From a UNICEF point of view, we would say all children have, e should have equal opportunities and have similar rights, and therefore we should realize um, all, uh, every child deserves the right to realize their full potential. The other way from an economic argument is, again, if you have a child who can eventually grow up and contribute very, um, as an engine for growth in your community in your country, and all, the only way for them, enable, for them to do that if they're vulnerable is to, get, is to receive direct assistance to bridge into the education system and to have the opportunities that more advantaged children have. So I think a fourth uh, idea I'll put on the table is to break the cycle of poverty linked education, you will still, you, um, we need a robust social protection system so that vulnerable children are also able to realize their full potential. So thank you very much again, uh, Dr. Talal uh, Ghazali, for this uh, opportunity, and I very much look forward to uh, any comments and thoughts. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I, I, would, I, would, I want to give the priority to the distinguished uh, participants to ask their questions, but I just want to focus on two elements I consider to be very basic in, in education. Um, so I, I, I'll give the floor to you. You have priority over me. وأشكر المحاضرة على هذه المحاضرة القيمة. نحن في الأردن حقيقة كنا نشكو من التعليم بشكل عام وخاصة بالنسبة للأطفال. الآن يقود مسيرة التعليم وزير بشير ومتميز. فهل محاضرنا الكريم يراقب هذه العملية وما رأيهم فيها؟ عملية التعليم الجديدة يعني اللي يقود وزير التربية والتعليم. التعليم في الأردن وليس في المخيمات داخل البلد أنا أعتقد أنه سؤال كويس مهم uh, maybe the question is uh, whether you have any role in uh, the development of the educational system of the Jordanian uh, ministry itself and uh, uh, if the answer is yes that would be great. If it is not, I would like to to ask you to, sub, to provide us with a document that we can present to the Ministry of Education. We are lucky in this country that we have a great minister. Omar Razaz is an outstanding minister of education, very open-minded, very pragmatic, very uh, eager to develop the system. So I'm sure he, he, will, uh, he will like to work with you on, uh, on uh, what you have uh, outlined as basics for uh, children and education. Um, thank you, uh, Doc. Thank you for the question. So um, maybe just one or two minutes on UNICEF in Jordan. Um, UNICEF has uh, been present in Jordan for more than 60 years. Um, and in 2002, 12, 13, we did shift our priority quite significantly, expanded to respond to the Syria crisis. We have responded to other crises in the past as well. Um, however, uh, over time, and particularly in the last uh, three years, we have shifted back to what we do well in countries, which is to work very closely with the government to improve access and quality of all services, including education. 
So currently we work very, very closely with the ministry and the minister. And actually the significant portion of UNICEF resources is now being channeled to strengthening the education system and working uh, more generally. This is my um, a little personal footnote. This is my seventh uh, country I've worked in with UNICEF. And I, for the first six before arriving in Jordan, I am used to advocating and trying to um, pull the ministry along to adopt certain policies. In Jordan, since the appointment of Dr. Razaz, I am playing catch up to try and uh, catch up to his pace of change yeah, and, so uh, is a great minister. and his ideas, um, which we fully support. Specifically, um, and some of which, by the way, I have stolen for tonight, uh, basically. Um, um, one of which is the importance of kindergartens. Um, he also feels very, the ministry feels very strongly about that. The ministry feels very strongly about shifting the um, emphasis within the public system to quality and increasing quality and the dynamism of the education system. And also is very engaged in youth. Um, so all of the areas I've mentioned today um, is also very much in support of and in collaboration with the government of Jordan more generally. Next. ميرسيدس <تصفيق> وأحيانا الفقر بحد ذاته قد يكون سبب لنقص التعليم هلا المسألة إنه إحنا عندنا بالأردن عدد كبير نسبة من الشباب هذه فرصة وليس تحدي فرصة لأنه التغيير بيكون دائما في الشباب أفضل بكثير ما يكون التغيير في إحنا كبار السن فهلا الفكرة هي إنه إحنا نميز بين التعلم والتعليم هلا لما نوفر وسائل وأدوات كثيرة للتعليم نعطي للطالب فرصة إنه هو يتعلم ما يحتاجه هاي المسألة كتير صراحة يعني مهمة هلأ في كتير من الأطفال بقول لك أنا بديش رياضة بس أنا بديش أتعلم بديش كذا هلأ التعليم لما ببدأ من الكاجي لازم يرافقه تعليم مهني بصراحة مش تعليم مهني كم يعني مش إنه بدي أخرجه أنا يعني مهني بس أنا أو أعرض عليه التعليم المهني يعرف يكون كيف بتحداده بالجارة لا شخري فالتعليم المهني يجب أن يوازي التعليم الأكاديمي حتى الطالب لما يوصل لمرحلة متقدمة في التعليم يقدر يختار إحنا بالنهاية ما بدنا نوصل الطالب للعاشر وبعديها يكون هيز كونفيوز يعني هو محتار خليه من الأول من الروضة يتعرف ببساطة على أشكال التعلم المختلفة ويتعلم اللي بيناسبه هلا مثلا عندنا بيئات مختلفة في بيئة ريفية بدوية حضارية إلى آخره طبعا التكنولوجيا التعليم وصلت لكل أنحاء المملكة والحمد لله هذا جهد كثير كبير لكن هذا ما بيمنع إنه اهتمامات الناس تختلف فا يعني أنا بعتقد إنه تركيز التعليم يكون على حاجات المنطقة هذا شيء جيد فبالتالي ممكن إحنا نمي الزراعة نمي الصناعة وهذا شكرا جزيلا Do you want me to Oh yeah No um, I I understood I understood Go ahead So I I would fully agree on everything you've said, um, and I think that your points are very well taken. I also fully agree on the various types of education that, uh, that she mentioned. Um, um, I think we all recognize, uh, and it's not unique, I think, to Jordan, but it does seem to be um, an overwhelming prioritization to uh, more academic-oriented vocational uh, post-secondary education. Um, and I think we all recognize, even now, when I go to many of UNICEF centers, when you ask a seven or eight year old vulnerable children what would they like to be when they grow up, there's an overwhelming doctors, um, doctors are number one, and engine, right. Which of course is, uh, are, is a very important vocation and something, but um, I think a key element that we need to work on within the education system, but also socially, is a much broader uh, view of pathways to success and pathways to be able to contribute to your uh, community. And I think that will take time. Um, I think we have amazing opportunities through social media and media in general, etc., to promote these, uh, a broader view 
of what it is to be um, successful, basically. But, but what is your reaction to the suggestion that at the early stages of children, to get them to practice uh, uh, occasional as, as they are doing their uh, academic, uh, their educational program. And I, I, I'm sorry I missed that. I, I, I heard you, but I didn't respond to it. I think you're absolutely correct. And I think many education systems have moved in that direction, which is a much more um, fluid way of, of learning uh, life skills, outside skills that are applicable, and uh, more academic-oriented uh, skills. In a in a much more harmonious way, breaking down that um, those those barriers, and it comes back to, to my my earlier point on youth, which is, I think the idea that I'm going to study exclusively study, um, and then enter the labor market. It's like a on fr on Thursday at 5 p.m. I'm a student, and on Sunday morning at 8 in the morning I'm going to work. Um, I think those, uh, the, I think a more dynamic interplay between learning employability skills and being able to contribute to economy and while learning ongoing is a, is a, is a way to be explored for the future. Thank you. My name is Joanna Piano. I'm working on governance area. Also, uh, I'm one of the members of the Talala Prasadipit. First of all, I would like to thank the to Talala to make this event possible. And uh, I would like to thank your, your presence uh, here, Your Excellency, and a big thank from all of us to UNICEF for what they are doing in Jordan and the, the world as as all. Well. Uh, my comment, uh, I would like to comment on uh, the youth engagement opportunities and how about to uh, collaboration between the UNICEF and the government, Jordanian governments to make uh, parallel uh, programs for youth engagement. Uh, uh, for the Jordanians and for uh, the refugees as well. Uh, also, uh, another point or maybe a question about the quality of education and the economic growth. Uh, based on your knowledge uh, and um, experience, uh, we would like to ask you to put uh, a practical uh, three or four steps for a roadmap to put uh, uh, to, to engage or to catch up the uh, education uh, in Jordan to the role model education all over the world, such as in London. So thank you so much. I'm uh, Naeb Ali Abu Liyel, Dr. Manaj Tadris. I've been studying for 25 years in the first three years. I'm going to talk about the experience of the Tarbawi. I'm going to talk about the right way to start the education. We start in the right way to the children. لأن أنا بعتبر خمس سنوات الأولى اللي بنسميها الفترة الحرجة هي الأساس، وإذا أردنا أن نبدأ مع الأطفال نبدأ معهم التعلم من خلال اللعب، إذا بدأنا يعملنا أركان زوايا، زوايا تعليمية، زوايا للعب، ينجح المعلم أن لما أتعامل مع طفل صغير أنا مش جاي بس يقرأ ويكتب، لا، أنا بعلمه من خلال اللعب، من خلال شيء، إذا نجح، ثاني شيء إذا كان في حب أساسي بين المعلم وبين الطفل سينجح المعلم، لانه انا اسمي هذه الفتره هي الفطام التدريجي، وجاي من عند امه، انا كيف بدي احتوي؟ اذا ما لم احب الطفل، لم يحب المدرسه لن انجح معه. من التجارب اللي انا عملتها شخصيه مع الاطفال، كانوا ما بيحبوا زي المدرسي، اضطريت اعمل جلباب زي نفس زي المدرسي مدارس الحكومه، عملت جلباب لبسته، لانه الطالب يتعلم من خلال النمذجه، فمن خلال هذا النموذج لا، الاطفال بحب المعلم وبحب شو لبس. الآن الآن إذا احنا عملنا التعليم ذو معنى وذو أهمية يستفيد الأطفال. إذا أنا أبدأ قديش أنا حابة التعليم قديش البيئة المدرسية لها دور. احنا عندنا في قد تكون عندي فئة مد... بيئة مدرسية فقيرة، بيئة مدرسية غنية، بس أنا دائما بحكي إنه المعلم الشاطر له دور أساسي بإمكاني على الأشياء بالإمكانات البيئية البسيطة، أنا بدي محسوسات لداخل الغرفة الصفية، بإمكاني أستغل خامات البيئة البسيطة، العلب، علب المصاص، الأشياء البسيطة، أنقلها الحمص، الأشياء البسيطة، بشرط أوفر الأمن والأمان للأطفال، ما أجيب شيء مثلا يأثر على الأطفال، يدمر في أمن وأمان الأطفال. الآن نحكي المنظومة التعليمية عبارة عن إيش؟ عبارة عن المدخلات، 
والعمليات والمخرجات شو مدخلات من المعلم المنهاج موجود إذا كان المنهاج يحقق رغبات التعليم رح ننجح فيه لأنه نحن إذا أردنا أن نحكم على أي دولة ومستواها من خلال التعليم ومن مناهجها الآن العمليات شو بيستخدم المعلم شو الاستراتيجيات الآن كل زمان مثلا معلم يستخدم مثلا الحفظ والتلقين الآن لا صار يفوت بحل المشكلات التفكير الناقد والتفكير الناقد وبعدين التعلم ممكن أن يفيد الطفل كثير ممكن أنا أنمع عنده التفكير من خلال خليه يطرح أسئلة خليه يعمل بهذا الطفل يتعلم بحيث أن أدمجهم خلال مجموعات ما ميز بينهم بين هذا ضعيف هذا لا أدمجهم أفضل تعلم للأطفال من تجربتي والتعلم من خلال الرفاق إذا هو يتعلم الرفيق أنا أجيب الرفيق الآخر يعلم الآخر فهنا أنجح أحطه في مشكلة معينة من هاي المشكلة راح يتعلم الطفل الآن إذا كان عندي مناهجنا قوية آه والمعلمين للأسف ضعاف رح يطلع عند المخرجات طلابنا ضعاف نهاية دوري بينما إذا كان العكس إذا كانت عندي المنهاج ضعيف شوية ومعلمنا قوي حين فإذا المعلم له دور إذا بتشتغل أنا لا أشتغل على الطلبة الحال أشتغل على المعلمين بالأساس وأبدأ من رياض الأطفال إنه إذا الآن أنا بنتقل للشباب الشباب يجب أن أركز على العمل التطوعي والسنة الجاية إن شاء الله رح يكون من ضمن وزارة التربية والتعليم سياستها يجب أن يلف الطالب 20 ساعة تطوع عمل تطوع إحنا في في المدارس أحيانا نلغي الرياضة والفن والموسيقى لا خلي الطفل يلعب ينط عشان يكون مبسوط جاي للمدرسة هو فرحان مبسوط خليه يعبر عن ذاته أنا بحكي مشاركة الشباب هي أساسية لأن إحنا مجتمع فتي أنا بقول التعليم يكسر الفقر وليس العكس يا ما في أطفال طلعوا من بيئات فقيرة ولكن كانوا علماء وكانوا مبدعين وكان ذلك فأنا بقول فرص متساوية إذا وفرنا بيئات متساوية بس أنا إلي مطلب نهائي أن يكون في المناطق النهائية فيها رياض أطفال فيها رياض أطفال أكثر من الموجودة داخل المدينة وشكرا لكم We thank, we thank you and welcome you as a member of our legislation system as, as a colleague uh, uh, um, in, in the parliament, uh, we, we appreciate your presence and your comments. Okay, Director of the Royal Health Awareness Society. Um, my question is twofold. One is, um, what is your recommendation to Jordan's education system to take winning pilots? Because we know we have successful initiatives that have been taking place in Jordan. Um, uh, take them up to scale, to build the momentum and to contribute to the economy. Uh, this is this is one. The other question is, in light of the refugee crisis that has burdened the educational system uh, for the past couple of years, have, what is your takeaway and the lessons that you have seen uh, or the lessons learned that can transform this? Um, burden into an opportunity to serve uh, the educational system rather than burden it and continue. What is the secret? What's the formula uh, that we can use? Thank you. Before before you your comments, I just I'm uh, um, I'm provoked by the question: What should be the objective of education? I am one person who believes that education should aim at one thing innovation and creativity. And that is why for the first time, I think anywhere in the world, we are starting in September, we have been licensed by the Ministry of Higher Education to have a university college that produces inventors. We do not teach you to learn, we teach you how to invent. And you graduate with an invention, not with an exam. We will not examine you to graduate you will never graduate if you do not come up with a feasible invention. This is a, 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 new, a new approach. And, and we have to remember that one of the greatest inventions of modern time was invented by a young boy whose age is 19, and he is now one of the top most valuable companies in the world and they're all in the knowledge world. Uh, Facebook, Zucker, uh, was, uh, Zuckerberg was invented Facebook when he was 19 years old. So we, we need to, 
teach children and not just university. I'm now starting with the university for innovation. It's called Talal Ghazali University for Innovation. I'm going to start a school also, if I get the permission, which will be a school for inventors. We don't need to graduate people with degrees, holding degrees just because they can announce. That's how I felt when I graduated. Okay, now I have my degrees. Why? Why did I graduate? To become educated? For what purpose? For what objective? To make money? To reach high positions? I believe that the only objective should be is creativity because we are in the knowledge age but now and in the knowledge age only knowledge creation is important and valuable and is the only way to creating wealth. So. Um, that's a hard act to follow. Um, uh, I think, uh, obviously, um, uh, inspiring this new perception of what it is to be educated and what it is to be successful is absolutely uh, key. Um, to, and I mean, it's just incredibly exciting to hear you talk and share those ideas. Um, on the roadmap question, it links a little bit to recommendations. Um, again, I think you have an incredibly inspired and um, enlightened, if you'd like to use that word, uh, minister currently, Dr. Razaz, and, he's in, and, and it's a, road, a very ambitious roadmap for the education system. And I think um, UNICEF and many other organizations in the international community will continue to support such a vision and do all that we can to, uh, to realize the, edu the education system's potential. Um, I think, as I mentioned in the beginning, I think one, to be specific, I do think universalizing access to kindergartens, KG1, KG2, which you would not normally think of was a key to quality education or to an economic growth, over and over we are learning globally it is actually one of the key indicators. So let children start uh, ahead and um, enter the grade one. Um, already ready to learn. Playing catch up, as any educator will know, is very, very difficult if a child starts late or starts behind. So that's one. Two, I mentioned about the quality of education and you've, and you've heard um, His Excellency talk about this. I think that would, is the ultimate, is to shift an education system, how it assesses learning, how it prioritizes learning towards the exact attributes that that um, His Excellency just mentioned. That can't happen overnight. You cannot transform a system in, in a day. But I think um, if we walk through uh, along a pathway to enable that, that will have a um, huge impact. Now, as uh, my colleague was also mentioning, the importance of the teacher, um, and her comparison was teacher with curriculum. I also think a, there's an interesting comparison between teachers and infrastructure, the buildings. Mm -hmm. And I think um, overall, the, uh, in countries all over the world, we have overly focused on infrastructure, meaning the, what the building looks like. Um, for me, um, there isn't an obvious, there isn't an automatic, I should say, correlation between the infrastructure, how nice a school is, and, and the quality of the learning inside it. Um, I think the key is for us to focus in on the quality of the learning and those the teachers that are enabling such a learning process. Recognizing, obviously, you need a certain level of infrastructure, but um, I think um, the initiative to uh, transition for all teachers to become certified will also be a big step forward. Um, so to professionalize the teaching uh, cutter will be a will be a big um, will also be a big step. And as I mentioned before, I think um, finding uh, opening up multiple pathways to transition to adulthood, meaning moving out of the school system into um, to lifelong learning, basically opportunities and engage with communities, working and otherwise. And it's, again, it comes back to initiatives of, of the organization we're currently in right now on um, online learning opportunities, more flexible learning opportunities mm -hmm. that one can do throughout uh, their life, 
um, is, a, is, a, is, a, is obviously a new way of thinking of education um, as opposed to stopping graduating and entering into a uh, into your first job and never going back to to um, learning um, on the uh, uh, I think on your question about the comment about pilots etc I think there is a risk um, in a country like uh, Jordan but in many many countries of many um, small scale pilots um, that are hard to uh, scale and that's a challenge of the ministry, it's a challenge of an organization like UNICEF. To me, I, I uh, feel that there are proven evidence-based interventions that have immediate impact on the issues we've been discussing that deserve the full weight of, uh, of the international community. And we need to be more disciplined, meaning all organizations working in, in, uh, in education, to support uh, those few limited interventions that can uh, go to scale. Um, I think uh, the refugee crisis and your comment about its burden on the school system. So um, there, is, uh, there is no doubt that the uh, addition of refugees in the country has placed an additional uh, burden on the schools. Um, and I, the solution, I think, has to be in finding win-win um, uh, initiatives so that any intervention that improves the school, uh, so organizations like UNICEF and others have additional resources now to, respond, to help the government respond to the Syrian crisis. How we spend those resources is critical so that there is a lasting positive impact on the school system, um, rather than specifically dealing with today's crisis, rather, how do we leverage these resources to improve the, the long-term sustainability of the education system? And I think that can be done um, through a whole bunch of ways, um, including, for example, additional resources to improve the the skills of teachers, the additional uh, resources we have to renovate and improve. Um, schools themselves, etc. It it can enable the system once the crisis is uh, passed to be stronger because of it. Thank you. I, I saw I saw three hands here. One, okay. and two, and three, and then we'll take another round. I'll have to excuse myself at six thirty, but my colleague uh, Fadi will. Uh, We'll, we'll take over. Yes, uh, my name is uh, Jamal Tamimi. I'm a, a media professor in Petra University. Uh, to be honest, I'm so pleased to be listening to your lecture, uh, which is a very interesting lecture. Uh, but really what attracted me is when you talked about the main question of your lecture, how we can break the cycle between the poverty and education. And this arises a new question, by which and by whom. And here I'm talking about the role of media as a media person. My question is, how do you reckon or how do you think in a country such as Jordan, which we have a lack of well-trained journalists and a limited budget and no long experience in social responsibility to achieve or to be a partner of this project and achieve the goals you talked about? عملت ممثل عن الدول العربية في هيئة الأمم المتحدة في الاتحاد الدولي للاتصالات وكان أحد أهم النقاط التي نتناقش فيها هي التعليم الإلكتروني وحصول الفقراء قبل الأغنياء على أكسس للإنترنت حيث أن عملية التعلم أصبحت غير محصورة في السور المدرسي فقط وليس في صف المدرسة وحده وإنما أصبحت عملية مستمرة يوميا تحتاج إلى وجود قدرة وقدرة هلوج أكسس لجميع هؤلاء الطلبة 
إلى خدمات الإنترنت خاصة فيما يتعلق بالمواقع التعليم العالي أو مواقع التعليم البداية أو الثانوي والأساسي لذلك نعتق أنا أعتقد أنه أي تعليم يجب أن يصاحب في هذه المرحلة هي مرحلة من التعليم الإلكتروني وإعطاء بعض الفقراء والذين لا يستطيعون الحصول على أكسس إلى الإنترنت يجب أن يتمكنوا من الوصول إلى هذه الخدمات وأن يكون لهم حق الوصول حتى يستطيعوا أن يحصلوا على نفس قيم التعليم التي حصل عليهم زملائهم أشكر أيضا المحاضر بشدة عندما تحدث عن كواليتي التعليم أو جودة التعليم لأن جودة التعليم اليوم أصبحت هي نحن في في عالم يتميز بالمنافسة إذا لم نستطع أن نخرج أجيال قادرة على المنافسة فلن نستطيع أن يكون لنا موقع في هذه المواقع أتوقع هذول القتال اللي أنا حبيت أثورهم وأنا دائما يعني بفتخر إني أنا خريج كلية طلال أبو غزالة هون وحاصل على جائزة طلال أبو غزالة للتميز عام 2015 وهذا أنا دائما أتشرف فيه وأذكر أن كلية طلال أبو غزالة هي كانت يعني بادرة نجاح كنا نشعر في التميز دائما في التعامل فيها وفي الخيارات وكانت بحق وليس مجاملة تمثل لكواليتي للتعليم وجودة التعليم وشكرا جزيلا لكم. I I I just want to respond on two points because what you said is very important. One in my capacity as the chairman of the Arab Organization for Quality Assurance in Education. We have uh, a, an agreement with the Ministry of Education and we have completed uh, a program for quality assurance and for ranking of, of schools, which was announced here a week ago by the, in, in a private session, but we are going to launch it very soon officially. So all schools will be ranked according to their quality so the families and the students know whether this school is, is, provides quality education or not. So we, uh, that is, is very important uh, and, um, and I am glad that the Minister of, of Education, Dr. Abul Razaz, is, uh, is very, very concerned about this and he, he, he delegated to me in my capacity as uh, chairman of the Arab League organization for quality assurance to, to lead this project which has been completed. It, is, it now stands to be, to, be, to be implemented. On online education, I'm fully with you and I, in my capacity as chairman of the UN task force and as chairman of the UN Global Alliance for ICT for Development, I drafted the Bill of Rights to Access to Internet, which I considered uh, to be a human right. And, uh, and uh, I, was, uh, I helped prepare the draft for that, which was adopted. Now, that is policy. But implementation, in response to a guidance by His Majesty, Talal Abu Azali established in Jordan, 300 knowledge centers which we equip with computers, programs, and free internet access throughout the country. So there is practically there is a Talal Abu Ghazali knowledge center in every city in Jordan, particularly in the remote areas, but including government, ministries, military departments, everywhere in the country. We have 300 of these stations which we provide with free internet access. for this point. Uh, both of us know, knows that uh, neither facilities nor materials are existed in our public schools. So what and where is your role as a UNICEF company in our schools, especially the local schools and the, rem the remote schools? So can you explain this one? Can I say it again? No, I understood. Yes. <laughs> okay, okay, let's get answers first and then we'll go another round. 
I'm not sure if I have all the answers. I think many of the comments tonight, you've uh, already, um, Your Excellency talked about the, um, the very important point of e-learning, and, and um, so I'm, I'll cover that. On the, on the question on uh, the role of journalists and uh, recognizing lack of trained journalists, and, but what role can journalists play? For me, um, I think what we've all been discussing is a change process, a change in, um, uh, in an education system and a change in uh, how youth aspire to uh, contribute um, to their communities, etc. I think journalism and the media can play a very key role in facilitating and encouraging such a process. I mean, some very practical things like documenting best practices, documenting, as His Excellency mentioned, the, the best schools and what practices and are being played, um, highlighting uh, excellent uh, practices by teachers. I don't know if anyone saw about three weeks ago or a month ago, they recognized the globally, the best teacher globally. Well, obviously, there isn't there's one ultimate teacher, but still, it enabled a whole discussion around celebrating teachers and what it means to be an excellent teacher and, and um, so I think there are very key um, uh, there's a very key contribution that that journalists can make um, on the lack of materials etc so UNICEF uh, as I think I mentioned works very closely with the Ministry of Education including providing financial and other assistance um, but um, I think it it's still um, needs, I know, it, uh, there are still much work to be done to ensure that all schools throughout the kingdom, particularly in remote and vulnerable neighborhoods, have the materials um, that are required. So I, um, we are doing all we can. I know the minister is as well, the government is, but um, I'll, I, I would say that I am optimistic of the future in the system in, in improving over time. And uh, just a closing point, because first, I'm, I'm, I'm very proud of you as a, as a graduate. And uh, the, uh, it, on, on online learning, on e-learning, we have been able, I was also asked to chair a commission in Jordan, of universities in Jordan, to develop proposals for a, a, a digital education. We have managed to get two things out of the government, which I think are a good step. That now the ministry recognizes digital or online degrees of recognized universities. So if I recognize Harvard, I should recognize an online degree from Harvard. That's number one. In, as, far, as for universities in Jordan, um, uh, we have managed to get uh, approval that, uh, that colleges can teach up to 20% of the program uh, online. And uh, that's a first step. And I'm very happy that we, we have been able to get this first step. At the Senate, I raised the question in the, in the Senate, uh, in my capacity as senator, why only 5% so far? Why don't they increase it? The answer was, we don't have adequate teachers who can teach online. So again, we come back to the question of teachers, that we need to improve the quality of teachers and to have more online teachers. And that is, again, I want to assure you, and I'm sure you will be very happy to hear this, the, at, the, at the basic education level, uh, uh, high school education, the minister has, Omar Razaz, confirmed that no ranking or uh, 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 promotion of any teacher, no teacher will be promoted unless he passes a test on information technology which we have provided. So the, there is what we call Talala Bogazali DIT, Diploma on Information Technology. Every teacher must pass that uh, exam if he is to be promoted in, in, in government schools. So, so as, as my dear friend said, we are in progress. We are very happy to say that this country eventually is now on the right track and there is definite improvement in the education system. My name is uh, Marwan Hanayim. I'm a trainer and educator as I'm a Capoeira. It's uh, Capoeira is a community builder. Uh, 
thank you so much uh, for having so, uh, this event. Sot, Sot. Yeah. yeah. My name is Marwan Deneim. I'm a trainer and educator as I am a Kapodista. It is a com community builder and art form. So uh, thank you for your presentation. It covered many aspects towards better education. My area is art, music, and activities. And through this type of education, we tackle into the field, uh, the desire to learn and to create, as well as focusing on certain values towards uh, creative, uh, uh, towards uh, collaboration, like some values such as collaboration rather than competition, and sustainability. Uh, As an individual, I only can work within my capacity. So uh, how we can work together towards the vision that you presented? That's my question. إنه بعد سنوات من الخبرة لا تقل عن 15 سنة في التدريس طبعا في في مجال الاي تي اظن انه احدى اهم المشاكل التي نواجهها احنا في الاردن هي مشكلة محاولة تطبيق برامج عالمية على بيئتنا ومناهجنا واحنا كمعلمين في كل فترة كل سنة سنتين تيجي عنا دورات نأخذها كما هي بدون أي تعديل عليها حتى تتماشى مع بيئتنا ومناهجنا هذا على ما أظن أنه مشكلة كبيرة السؤال اللي أنا حاب أطرحه لفضية الدكتور الأستاذ وضيفه هل بإمكان مجموعة طلال أبو غزالة بتعاون مع اليونسف محاولة تطبيق برامج تتماشى مع بيئتنا ومناهجنا أو الأفضل تطوير البيئة اللي عندنا ومناهجنا بحيث تتماشى مع هذه البرامج العالمية شكرا الله يعطيكم العافية جميعا أنا لا مسلم على الهوائي أول شيء نشكر سعادة الدكتور طلال أبو غزالي اللي دائما ينورنا ويوجهنا دائما للصح وملتقى معرفي صح ونشكر كمان قسم الاتصال الذي أثبت موجوديته وخلاصه لعمله لمجموعة طلال أبو غزالي على هذه الدعوة الكريمة سؤالي هل يدفع دول العالم الثالث لا سيما الأردن مو... عن نتيجة مواقفه السياسية الثابتة والراسخة اتجاه القضية الفلسطينية شكرا هل هل شو السؤال؟ هاي السؤال؟ السؤال برا السؤال مرة ثانية تكرار السؤال هل يدفع دول العالم الثالث لا سيما الأردن ثمن مواقفه السياسية الثابتة اتجاه قضية القدس؟ هل مؤثرات هل يوجد مؤثرات خارجية على المنظمات الدولية وادي يونس؟ بعد السؤال شو Again, come on. This question is for you, Nasser. She? No. Okay. okay. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you. I don't think you understood his question, so you're just I happy that no, I understood it. Okay. I will explain it to you. Okay. <laughs> it's, it's the question. Sakir, and the Sama. Sakir, Okay. The question is: Are we in Jordan? Paying the price of, of our because of our stand on the issue of Palestine, ah. and we are being penalized <coughs> for what we believe is our <coughs> right and just position on the Palestinian issue. Sah <laughs> kalami? Okay, but uh, that's for you. Uh, I mean, uh, is is this? Is this uh, feeling right and does it impact your operations? This is the question. I understand. As relates to the question addressed to me, I think I, I'm, I'm a person who, who likes to look at the future. I don't think in the future we're going to have the problem that you face today. Because I would love to, be, to come the day when we are like Sweden where the ministry has nothing to do with the education system in the country. 
it becomes a private sector operation which is managed by the forces of the private sector. As of next year, all educational institutions under government control in Sweden will be outsourced to the private sector. I believe that this is the trend, this is what's going to happen in the future. It's inevitable that education becomes a private responsibility. I have just come two weeks ago from Harvard University and from MIT, and I spoke at both universities on the 15th at MIT and on the 16th of last month at Harvard. And uh, I, have, I have news for you that when I asked uh, the leadership of these universities about their relationship with the Ministry of Education or Higher Education, that the answer was it is similar to our relationship with the Ministry of Agriculture. The ministry has nothing to do with our programs. The ministry has nothing to dictate on us. If they want information, they have it on the website. But we decide the programs. We have full control and authority on our programs and not the, the ministry. Inshallah, we will reach here. Inshallah. But maybe you can highlight some answers that combines all. I will, oh, right? <clears throat> well, first of all, I was, um, I would have been even more intimidated if I knew at the beginning I had so many educators in the room, so, and students for that matter. So um, it's been a very impressive uh, group of people here, and so thank you very much for, for allowing me to participate in this. I hope the conversation continues, not only in this room, but in all, your, in all of our various jobs and in all of our different positions. Um, maybe just a few uh, key, just simple and, and uh, quick responses. On, um, on the role of private schools, I think you answered your own question in some of the ideas that you put on the table, which I think are very exciting. I think um, UNICEF has underutilized such an amazing resource, to be honest, because um, you're right, we, we focus exclusively on the public system, um, but I think we should we as UNICEF should think much more broadly in how we can partner and, and I think the ideas that you've uh, suggested. And it links a little bit to the last comment on um, social responsibility of different organizations and bodies. So I think that's something that we should, uh, we should take forward and, and continue to explore. Um, there were comments on um, the importance of uh, pre-kindergarten and pre uh, uh, early childhood, I can't agree with uh, the person more. I think it's absolutely spot on, um, and it's something that we do work on, uh, parenting skills and uh, community-based programming and uh, reaching households, etc. but it's an area that um, I think it's, I, I agree completely how critical the, um, even prior to um, kindergarten, prior to um, organized learning. Um, there was a gentleman who mentioned the importance of uh, an academic certificate and the lack of a certificate and what that has meant. I do think that's a very important point, which is um, uh, the emphasis still in the, in the education system on the piece of paper that one gets. And I think this links a bit to uh, this transition that I think we can all explore, which is to focus more on the learning and the skill development and less on the final uh, diploma that one uh, and the name of that diploma that is highly prioritized. And it links to the comment uh, made by, um, by the, the second to last speaker, which was talking about the still this focus on some very narrow fields, medicine and engineering, et cetera, and receiving that piece of paper rather than a, a more dynamic a wide, a broader interpretation of success and learning, etc. Um, and of course, we fully support the important point on the importance of investing in education. And in a way, that's I guess the conclusion is um, is uh, is, and I think I'm speaking to the converted, which is how critical education can play in breaking the cycle of poverty and how important quality education is. To, uh, to a country, all countries, but including Jordan. And that brings me 
to pass back to our chair. Thank you. Thank you very much. I, it remains just to thank you, Your Excellency, for giving us the benefit of, the, of your knowledge. I, I learned a lot from you, and I am grateful to you all for being with us today. You made the meeting very productive. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Shukran. Thank you very much. That was very kind. This is an appreciation and a memory of your valuable visit to us. Thank you very much.